let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful time together that we can spend in your word. We know that the more that we look at it, the more that we read it, the more that you speak to our hearts and make us more like you. So Lord, as we look into it, we pray that you might enlighten our minds, that you might uh, help me and guide me in my um, frailties and humanity, that I might communicate it clearly as you would have me. I pray that might be with everybody who's out there within the hearing of my voice, that you might strengthen them from the inside, that you might build them up by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you might help us through this difficult time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been going through the book of 1 John. We're now in chapter 2, verses 18 and following, and just uh, as a way of reminder, this is where we are in North Middletown, New Jersey, uh, and if you'd like to come see us, we're on Ocean Avenue. Be glad to see you. Previously here at Grace, we talked about bad love. The Bible does teach us about love that is bad. It's just the wrong kind of love. And the scripture says here in verse 15, 1 John 2, Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So as we looked at the scriptures, we saw that what we're not to set our hearts and our affections on are the things of this temporary earth, the system that this world has, to draw us away from God, to make other things priorities, to create idols in our lives. And we talked about that last time. In Romans 8, verses 12 to 14, we're given an admonition by the Apostle Paul. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. And so we're given this explanation as to how we're to set our affections and our hearts on these things. So as we move on and go through, you'll notice as we go through 1 John, the beginning talks about light and darkness. So he goes on and talks about what it is to be in the light, what it is to be in darkness, and those two things contrasted. The next thing he talks about is love and hatred. For us to have a kind of a despising and a looking away from the love of this world and to love one another. In fact, the scripture says that if you can't love your brother whom you do see, how can you love God whom you don't see? So these are the similar themes that he's been going through, and now we're going to get into truth and error as we go into chapter 2, verse 18 and following. So what this looks like is he's going to be speaking about the Antichrist, which I'll explain. There's a way of departing, denying, and deceiving, and then there's the Holy Spirit, the one who teaches us and who reveals things to us and keeps us in Christ. So as we uh, go through this and as we read through the passage, just keep your eyes open for it. It begins in verse 18 of 1 John chapter 2, and he begins, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. For I have written to you because you do not know, because, I'm sorry, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is in the truth. Who is a liar but him who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. And what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. 
but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, he may, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So as we look at the passage, he begins by calling us, or those who he's writing to, little children. It's interesting because he did this some weeks ago as we looked at uh, chapter 2 in the early portion. He, he talks about little children and fathers, and he says little children. Uh, this is a man in his 90s, so he has the right to call all of us little children. At, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. We know that uh, he uses this term last hour. He, he means that it is the end time, as far as time is concerned, as far as the calendar of all of Earth's history is concerned, we're towards the end. And certainly at the time of this writing, we are much closer to the end than he was at that point. And I just take consoling in the fact that it says in 2 Peter 3, 8, and it says, my beloved, do not forget one thing, that the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So God is not on the same timetable that you and I are on. So when he says this is the last hour, you would figure he's coming in the next 60 seconds or 60, 60 minutes, but that's not what he means. He means it is the last time, and the rest of the scripture bears this out too, so as he refers, he says, as we approach the end, it's just going to get worse and worse. So make sure you keep your eye on the skies, essentially. So he also mentions in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, the things we can anticipate coming to that last hour as the world kind of winds down and the degradation of this earth begins coming to its zenith. This is what it will look like. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused, if it is received with thanksgiving. I find it interesting that the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy says, here's some ways that you can find out what a doctrine of demons are. Here's how you can find out what it is that in the end times when things begin to get bad, there'll be people telling you lies and hypocrisy, and they will be telling you you shouldn't eat certain things because they're evil, or that you shouldn't marry. I find that very curious that the scripture labels that the doctrine of demons. So be very, very careful what you hear or what you think is in the scriptures or maybe what's handed down to you by tradition. It doesn't necessarily come from God. It may be the manufacturings and, and the imaginations of men. So truth and error is one of those things that the scripture splits out very carefully for us. But this is what we were told to look for in the end times. And he says, it is the last hour, the Antichrist is coming. And, and you may not be familiar with that word in a biblical fashion. Uh, certainly, movies like The Omen and everything else make the Antichrist to be some kind of a, an evil person that you can readily see on the outside. The scripture has a very different view. In fact, the word Antichrist is only used of the Apostle John in his writings, in the five books in which he actually authors. Uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the book of Revelation, and John, the Gospel of John. So it, Antichrist is a word that he uses. Paul uses a slightly different word, but he's speaking of the same person. There are three different aspects of Antichrist. There is the spirit of Antichrist, where anyone who is against Christ or putting something else in place of Christ, that's what anti, Antichrist means. It's in place of Christ or against Christ. The spirit of Antichrist we know is already at hand. In fact, he says it here in, in the scriptures. But we understand that there will be ultimately a person 
who embodies all of the evil of the world, and they're going to be sweet talkers. They're going to bring peace for a time. They're going to get everyone to join hands and have a one-world government. That is a very different thing. Uh, that is the Antichrist, the person who will personify uh, evil incarnate. But he's not going to come with horns and a red tail and, and all of that. He's going to be a very persuasive person politically and economically. So there are three aspects of that, and we have already seen the spirit of Antichrist work through certain people. I think of Stalin. I think of Hitler. I think of these folks who are definitely in place of Christ, becoming themselves Christ. Uh, which are no Christs whatsoever. So it says here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, Let no one deceive you by any means that the day will not come unless the falling away happens first. So Paul agrees with John that there'll be a falling away of those who call themselves Christians. And he says that has to happen first before the end happens. And the man of sin is revealed. That's the term for the Antichrist. The son of perdition, another word for the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, or proclaiming himself that he is God. So this is the, the, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who will come in the end times and be revealed. He's going to set himself up, and he's going to call himself God. So that is the Antichrist who's coming in the end times. I hope to see this from the bleachers as opposed to being here. So... Some people have surmised it might be the president, it very well could be the pope, or it might be um, any number of people, might be the Antichrist. Um, it, he very well could be alive today on the earth and accumulating power and importance. But who he is, it's anybody's guess at this point. And like I said, I hope to be on the bleachers to see it from heaven. Verse 19, it says, they went out from us but they were not of us. He's talking about those who have departed from the faith, those who have departed from having faith in Christ and certainly fellowship in the body. They were not of us. If they had been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So he's talking about those who come out of the church. So the Antichrist and those that have the spirit of Antichrist aren't generated by the world system necessarily, but they come out of the church, which tells me that's a, that's a really sad thing. It's also something that we need to keep our eye on, especially as pastors and teachers, and just discerning people. Not everyone who claims to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord knows him truly. They very well might be trying to deceive, and the scripture tells us we should be on, the to on our toes for that, because they are like wolves in sheep's clothing. So, just because somebody looks like a sheep doesn't make them a sheep. It says here in 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit expressly says in a latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. These are people that will come out of a Christian church, or at least they claim to know Jesus Christ as Savior, but they aren't. In Matthew 10, 34 to 36, Jesus says this very striking statement, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He's actually quoting Micah chapter 7, verse 6, that the enemies of a man will be of his own household. Uh, Jesus was speaking a bit prophetically, too, because if you remember, Judas was one that came out of the twelve, who came and turned Jesus in. And it says that there will be those in the church who leave, and they'll just leave behind their faith in Jesus Christ, and they'll just turn over to these deceiving spirits. So it's something that we should be careful of and understanding of within the body of Christ. Verse 20, but you, notice he's seeing them, 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 and now he's saying, but you, totally different story, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. He's talking about an anointing from the Holy One. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is found all throughout the Scripture, and it's very clear what, what it is. Jesus teaches what that is. If you remember Jesus, when he was baptized, that actually is an anointing, if you will. He went in 
to the waters, and John the Baptist is uh, in, in the plain vernacular, what the heck are you doing here? Uh, I should be baptized by you. And he says, well, we must fulfill all righteousness for now, so just, just get it done. And he did. That was the entrance to his ministry. And anyone that takes the position of king in the Old Testament, you'll see there's an anointing that happens. You'll see Samuel, he takes on the position of priest uh, or prophet. He is anointed. You see priests that enter into the service of the temple, they're anointed. Uh, Aaron himself, uh, we, we talk, there, there's discussion of that, and I don't have the passage here, but about how oil runs down on Aaron's beard. And all of this is an anointing. Actually, uh, it was interesting to find out what the word means. It means a smearing, a schmear. I just found that interesting. That's what anointing means. But he says, you have an anointing from the Holy One. This is the Holy Spirit of God, which is completely different than the spirit of Antichrist. In fact, you can't have one without the other, and you can't have the other if you have the one. That's just very plain in the Scriptures. John chapter 16, verses 12 to 13 says, I still have many things to say to you. This is Jesus towards the end of his ministry, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. By the way, the Spirit of God is a he, not a it or a thing. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Jesus prophesied that the Holy Spirit would come, and he says, listen, it's a good thing that I'm leaving you. And he says, uh, you know, where I go, you can't follow. And he says, it's a good thing I'm going, because then I will send the helper, and that's another word for the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside the paraclete, in the original language, the one who comes alongside to help. So Jesus is talking about this anointing of the Holy Spirit that will guide you into all truth. And it's it's not maybe as you might literally read it. Hey, listen, I got the Holy Spirit. I know everything. Well, I, I would quiz you and ask you a few questions just to test that fact as to whether the scripture really means that or whether it means that everything that you need to know will be told you and the Holy Spirit will guide you into it. Certainly, the Word of God is that which teaches us. Certainly, examples of those who go before us are things that teach us. But the Holy Spirit of God teaches us as we're in prayer, as we speak to Him, as we read the Word. The Holy Spirit brings things into our heart and helps us to understand what's written. So all of these things indicate that Jesus, although gone, He did not leave us as orphans. He sent His Holy Spirit to guide us. And we have no need for anyone to teach us anything the Spirit of God will teach us. Well, some people use that as an excuse not to go to church. And yet the Scripture is very clear that we are the body of Christ collectively, not individually. And I have a need to be sharpened by other people. So it doesn't mean that I have no need of anyone else, or I should never read a book, or I should never seek to polish off or to increase the gift that God's given to me to make it better. It means that we don't walk around and have no guide. We know who God is, and because of that, the Spirit of God guides us and leads us into all truth. So the anointing, this smearing, if you will, the peace of God that has been placed inside of you, the Scripture is very clear that he will not let it go unanswered or unreturned to him. I think about the, the woman at Jesus' feet who wept and anointed his feet with her tears and wiped with her hair. She did this in preparation of his death. And also the anointing of King David as he was anointed and made king or Solomon. All of these folks were anointed, and this is the beginning. It's a, it's a, it's a, a symbol of prayer and the, the Holy Spirit himself coming. So here in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, For you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Scripture teaches very clearly that if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you don't belong to Jesus. They're one or the other. You, you either have the Spirit of this world, the Spirit of the Antichrist, or you have the Spirit of God inside of you. If you don't have the Spirit of God inside of you, then you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's pretty clear. So it's important. In verse 22, the question is asked, Who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist. Now he's saying that this person who says this is inspired by Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son, who 
Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So Jesus says, it's, you, you can't have the Father without the Son. And there are those that say, yeah, me and the guy upstairs, you know, we're in a good condition. We have a good relationship. You know, we have an understanding. Well, where are you with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? And there are folks that come out of uh, a Christian tradition, and yet they are not Christians whatsoever. You have folks like the Mormons who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, God the Son. They believe he was a good person. They believe he was a human being. They believe he was an angel. They believe all sorts of things, but they do not believe in his deity. In fact, that is one of the ways that you can tell if somebody's in a true belief of who Jesus is. Do they recognize his deity, everything that Jesus claimed to be about himself? He said, I and the Father are one. It's very clear. If you have Jesus, you have the Father. There's no way that you will have the Father unless you have Jesus. In fact, he is the one, he's the mediator that causes what, whoever we are to be acceptable before God. Because in and of ourselves, we're sinners, as the scripture teaches. And none of us has a right to even go before a perfect and holy God. And yet Jesus has taken upon our sin and offered us salvation for whomsoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So that is the bottom line. If you, if you say, I know God, I'm good with God, but I reject Jesus, you don't have the Father. You don't know God. You're deceived. And you're a liar. And the scripture is pretty clear about that. I didn't say it. And just because the truth, um, you know, just because you put your fingers in your ear doesn't mean that uh, it's going to change the truth. The truth is the truth the way that it is. And there is no such thing as a variable truth uh, in, in God's kingdom anyway. In John 6, 45, it is said, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Jesus said, if God is truly speaking to you, and if he's spoken to your heart, you will be led to Jesus. Not Buddha, not um, the Watchtower, not any other thing, but Jesus himself. The Father draws those to Jesus. And bottom line, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no man that comes to the Father except by him. And that's the scripture. In John 14, 7 to 9, Jesus says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus very boldly equated himself to the Father and the Father with him. So if you don't have Jesus, you don't have the Father. The scripture is real clear about that. So as we move on, verse 24, Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. The word abide is not really a word that we use today, but it's used throughout the scriptures. To abide means to live in. If you live in a home and if you're locked down and you don't go anywhere and you're in your house, you abide in your house. You live in your house. Jesus said, you should abide in me, which is uh, an interesting concept. We live in him when we give up our lives, essentially. We give up our will and we say, Lord, I will do whatever it is that you would have me do. We live and move and have our being in him when we do that. Jesus says here in John chapter 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus asserts that the only way that we're going to bear any good fruit, any spiritual fruit, anything that's going to last of eternal value, it's going to come because we abide in him, we live in him. We surrender our own agendas, our own lives, and we look to him for our strength, our provision, our protection. In Ephesians 4, chapter 29, verses 29 to 32 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve 
the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the scripture teaches us that the Holy Spirit is God's stamp on us, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, that his Holy Spirit is not going to be deposited on us. If somebody came and put $10 and said, I want to buy your car for an extraneous amount of money, and gave me $10, I wouldn't think that to be much of a deposit. The birds leave a deposit. I don't count that as a deposit either. But if somebody gives something substantial, I bet you it'll be back. And Jesus is the same way. He's put his Holy Spirit inside of you, guaranteeing that he will come back. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. This is how we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Notice he says that we should abide in him and we shouldn't, we, we should live in him and not reject the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. God speaks to us in our conscience and in our heart, and he tells us those things that he would have us do. And the way that we don't abide in him is if we just say, ah, I don't feel like doing that today. I want to go off and, you know, I want to eat an entire pizza, or I, I want to eat something I shouldn't, or do something I shouldn't, or uh, this person doesn't deserve my, my forgiveness. Any of those sort of things is when we're not abiding in Christ, we're living in the flesh. We're doing that which is natural to us. And uh, unfortunately, that leads to death, as we looked at last week. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And then he begins in verse 26, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. There are folks, one of the third things that people will do, number one, these antichrists or those who have the spirit of antichrist are going to fall away from the fellowship. They're going to pull themselves away from the church. They certainly reject authority and they reject the authority of the scriptures. The next thing that they're going to do is they're going to be self-deceived in themselves. And the third thing that they're going to do is they're going to try to deceive others. They themselves, they'll deny Jesus Christ, that he's the Son of God, that he is God the Son. And the third thing they do is they will begin to come after you and try to deceive you and to get followers of themselves, as Jesus says. So it's like a lure for a fish. They will, they will put it out there and it will look like it's real. It will look as though it's enticing and it's edible, but it's not. There's a hook. And that's what the deceivers will do. And it doesn't matter how you might try to open somebody's eyes. If they don't want to open them, it probably isn't going to happen. And there are folks who are deceived. They think they know something other than what Jesus said. They put their own word higher than what Jesus says. And you can try to force their eyes open, but they will resist. And there's not a thing you can do unless the Spirit of God touches their heart and there's a change. So be careful of trying too hard to share something with someone who doesn't want to hear you. The scripture in Galatians 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There are people who try to say that they're okay with God, and yet they reject Jesus Christ. Don't you worry about it. Whatever you think, that, or whatever they think they're getting away with, they're not getting away with anything. There will be a judgment day, and it's coming sometime in the very near future, when Jesus will hold, hold us all accountable for what we do. And believers, certainly at the white throne judgment, will be held accountable for them not accepting God's gracious gift of forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 23, Jesus begins to give us warnings about those who are antichrist. And he says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They just want to make a meal of you. You will know them by their fruits, by their behavior, the things that come out of their lives. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
So you can know a false teacher, a false prophet, someone who's inspired by Satan himself, the spirit of Antichrist, where Jesus isn't Christ, but something else, where someone else is a substitute. You'll know this by their behavior, not by what they say, maybe even on TV. You won't know necessarily by what they say, but how do they live? If they say one thing and they live another way, that tells you that they're hypocrites. So if you really want to know if they're true or not, take a look at what they do and how they behave. And if it doesn't match the scriptures, then they're wrong and the scriptures are right. He begins again here in verse 20, Therefore, by their fruit you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus tells us there will be false prophets, people who pretend, and they'll call Jesus Lord, but it's a different Jesus than what you and I understand from the teaching of Scripture. It's a Jesus who's Jesus in, in name only. He's not the Son of God come to save us. So keep your eyes open for that. Verse 27, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, lives in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So the question is, can a true believer be deceived? Well, according to the scripture, you cannot. If the Spirit of God is truly in you, you will abide in him, and he will abide in you. There's not really a choice in that. Once you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and you've been adopted by him, you may let him down a thousand times, but he will never leave you or forsake you. And I'm so glad for that. So I remember when Jesus was anointed, when he began his ministry, and the Spirit of God fell upon him. It's emblematic of what happens to a believer when they come to know Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in our heart. So... In John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear it them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Notice all truth. It's the same thing that he said here earlier. It's not about knowing everything. It's about you can rely upon God to give you the information that you need at the time that you need it. In fact, there's another passage where Jesus tells his disciples, you will be called before people and you'll have to give an account for my name's sake and you'll be persecuted. And he says, when you get there, don't think about it be beforehand what you're going to say because the Spirit will give you the words that you should say. Jesus himself through his Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need to say at that time. So you don't need to worry. You don't need to work out in your mind what you're going to say or what sort of defense you're going to have. The Spirit of God will lead you, which you, you can never read enough books because you're never good enough. You're never smart enough. You're never articulate enough. God knows I know that. So what do you do? You rely upon the Holy Spirit of God, and he's the one that guides us and leads us into all truth, all the truth that we need, all the truth about who God is. So Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, because it's been promised in the Old Testament and by Jesus himself, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is evidence that God is in you the hope of glory, and that Jesus Christ truly has reconciled you to himself. The evidence is that you have a changed heart, that you have a new mind, that your life reflects those things that Jesus would have you do, and it's because the Holy Spirit has come up to take residence in your body, which is why he's going to come take us home before he pours out wrath on the rest of this world, because he's not, he has not appointed us unto wrath. And he gives us a last word. And now, little children, abide in him. That when he appears, 
you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. It's an interesting thing. Is he speaking to believers and saying, listen, you need to do the right things now because you'll be ashamed later? Well, I think maybe he is. I think the people who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those who have rejected him as God himself in the body, I think they will certainly be ashamed. But he's now speaking to fellow believers and saying, you know, if you do these things now, you won't be ashamed later. And I think, wow, I, I never thought of coming before the Lord and being ashamed. I just thought everything was going to kind of be done away with. And then I pulled up this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. It says, there's no other foundation anyone can lay which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, the foundation of who Jesus is, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, these are the various things that we build on with the knowledge of who Jesus is. We build on it with scriptures and we read various books and other doctrines and things. It says that we build on that foundation with these elements. Let each one's work become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. The scripture talks about how there are things that we put into our lives, and upon the, the understanding of who Jesus is in our relationship, we put those things on top, and we gain kind of a eschatological understanding and we gain a salvific understanding and you build your theological understanding of who God is and, and our concepts and there are good things to put into there and there are some not so good things to put into there. I believe that there will be Christians that go to heaven who have come out of the word of faith movement, who name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, you know, they think that God comes into their life and they'll never have a heartache, they'll never get COVID, they'll never die, they'll live forever, healthy, wealthy, wise. I think there are people who actually know Jesus Christ, and I think they're on the right side of the Red Sea, but they're on the wrong side of the Jordan. Uh, they have not added these wonderful things that you can add to your understanding from the scriptures. They've added things that are secondary. And once they go through the fire, which is the translation of our soul from the physical to the metaphysical, that it's not going to last. It's all going to go away. And we will be ashamed of the things that we look back on. I think about how many weeks I've been stationed in my home, and I think, my goodness, what did I really accomplish? I should have accomplished so much more. I mean, this is weeks and weeks of time. And then my wife reminds me that I haven't just been lazy. I've accomplished a few things, but I'm inspired to move on because at some point they're going to open up all the businesses and everything will be open and all of our time away and, and you know, kind of dug down into the trenches will be over. And anything that could have been done with that time will have been done and sealed. I don't want to feel bad that I didn't use my time well. So I would exhort you, use your time well. And it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in a hospital bed and use your time well. You can be almost anywhere and use your time well so that you don't look back and get ashamed. So that when it's all over and you say, gee, what did I accomplish in that time? You don't look back and you're not ashamed of how you spent your time. So, and now little children, abide in him. It, it's as though Jesus were asking us to come to him and to walk as he walks I think of Peter on the Sea of Galilee when he was walking on water doing that which none of the other disciples could ever claim that they did. And they, he walked out to Jesus and he was able to do something that Jesus did because he had his eyes on Jesus. You know, we can do those things that God asks us to do, but it's certainly not going to be under our own power. Um, you know, you, you have to have a kayak on each foot if you're going to fake it. But with Jesus, the real thing happens and we can do that. We can do exactly what the scripture tells us to do, which is to abide in him so that we're not embarrassed when he comes back. So 
It says here in 1 John 2, 5 and 6, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So if you want, the, if you want God's love perfected in you, do what he tells you to do. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't struggle with God's leading in your heart and say, oh, but I really, really want to do this stupid thing. Just, just give it up because the love of God will be perfected in your heart. And I don't know about you, but if there's anything that I need, it's more love in my heart for other people and for God. So that's the way to do it. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. So we're told to walk like Jesus did. And sometimes that means walking on the water. And it's possible if God calls you out. If he says, come to me, and he tells you to do it, you can do it. But there's an obligation to those who call on the name of the Lord to walk like Jesus walked, to behave like Jesus behaved, to say those things the way Jesus would say those things, and to say them with the right heart and the right motive. Those are all proofs that you know him, is when you begin to sound like him, when you begin to walk like him, when you begin to feel the things he feels, think the thoughts he thinks. That is evidence that you have a relationship with God, not just a declaration. It has everything to do with the way that we live. So, in looking over this passage, I hope that you've taken great encouragement to be more like Jesus in every way. The Holy Spirit is he who has come into us, and if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, well, then you don't have the Holy Spirit and you don't know what I'm talking about. But he can come into your life and just make you completely new because you recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he came and he died, and that he rose from the dead to prove he was who he was, and that he can do what he says he can do, and he can do it for you. I pray that the Lord bless you in the hearing of his word today. In Jesus' name.